I would worked at a white owned media company for about 10 years and at this black owned advertising agency for five years. And I can tell you the difference between being at a minority owned company and being at a white owned company. So often you'll hear about this kind of burden around kind of code switching and kind of having to perform. Me, I felt because I was one of the, if not only on most occasions, brown people around, I had to do some sort of different justification, explain, like over explaining the reason why yet I belong here. You know what I'm saying? Like, and where I work now, all that shit, like, I don't have to worry about none of that, bro. I don't know why or how that's true, but it's just so crazy. Like, it's just so crazy. The difference. This is The Change Up. I'm Keith Hernandez, and this week we welcome Carlos Aguilar, founder of Mestizo Coffee. His goal is to bring top shelf Mexican American coffee to coffee lovers across the globe. We talk about the craft of coffee roasting, how branding and storytelling is key to his DTC company and the lessons learned from the TV and advertising world. All right, really excited about my next guest today. We have Carlos Aguiar, the founder of Mestizo Coffee. Carlos, what's up, man? Just right here, just enjoying life on the West Coast in Los Angeles, trying to soak up all this sun, try to ride a positive vibe, but you know, this virus is doing everything it can to to slow us down, but yeah. we're gonna vibe right through it, aren't we? We were promised hot girl summer and we got nothing. <laughs> no well that's that's good because i was able to keep on my shirt uh during the summer <laughs> yeah and we'll see what we can do moving forward to you know maybe take it off sometime this year yeah so delta's keeping us home once again and you decided to start a company through the pandemic right like so walk me through this was this an idea that you had pre-pandemic that you just had more time to go and do it during the pandemic or was this something that happened with the spare time that you were sitting there in your, your living room figuring life out Sure. I mean, uh, you know, my background is in music and I loved that when I was a, a hip hop artist, I had a product in hand. So when I was in college, you know, I had a product that I can talk about when I was working and I was meeting other people in the industry, I had a product I could talk about. And then my kind of music career waned and I was productless. <laughs> um, and uh, although I was still working in, in entertainment and for a long time, I would wanted to have a product to call my own because I knew that, you know, I knew that it'd be able to potentially generate some wealth in the long term if I was able to own something of my own, you know, as I worked for others. For sure. you know? So that's so that had been an idea, you know, for a while since I I kind of closed that chapter on my my music career, and then working at an advertising agency for the last six years, I've come out of television. I was neck deep in the digital world yeah. and in creating content, developing strategies on behalf of brands and celebrities. And again, I was like, damn, I wish I had something to call my own. And, you know, three or four years ago, um, I had a conversion experience, if you will, with specialty coffee, okay. where I had a buddy who through social media, I noticed was competing in coffee brewing competitions. Okay. And I drank coffee like, like other, most people just 7-Eleven, McDonald's, Starbucks, even sometimes at home. But this notion that someone would compete in brewing coffee was really intriguing. For sure. And I invited him to our agency and was like, hey, bro, can you make some of this, this magic that I see you doing <laughs> uh, on the internet? And he came in and my buddy, who was a philosophy professor, so I knew it was kind of, it was already coming from a different angle. He came in and he had a scale. He had his, he brought his own water. He brought beans. He weighed, he started weighing shit. His kettle had a weird shaped neck. It was like a science experiment. And I was like, okay, that's cool. Let's taste it. And when I did, I was like, wait a minute, I taste blueberry in this. And I didn't see you put any blueberry additive in this coffee. Like, and it just kind of opened my mind up to the prospect of having these really interesting flavor profiles and something that I'd been drinking most of my adult life and had never tasted before. And so anyway, so that, that kind of conversion experience resonated with me because of my background where I had like a religious conversion experience that landed me ultimately in seminary. Hold on. Let's stop there for a second. You went to the seminary for a while. I went to seminary and got a master's degree in the philosophy of religion and ethics after undergrad, uh, because I was going to go and teach philosophy. That was my ambition. But while in seminary, or oh, shortly after I graduated seminary, I backpacked through Mexico for a year and a half. Oh, wow. Try to connect with my Mexican American background as a third generation Mexican American. I didn't speak Spanish, yeah. but I grew up in a neighborhood that was 90% Latino. 
in the San Gabriel Valley in Los Angeles. So I decided after grad school, I was going to backpack through Mexico, which I did, came back and um, was going to teach philosophy, but got my first job writing in television at that oh, time. Wow. So that kind of set me on a different kind of career path. So my ambition with coffee was like this conversion experience I had, I had around something that was so familiar, like coffee reminded me of that kind of religious conversion experience of my youth. And the same kind of zeal I had in telling people about like the religion of my youth, I had now about coffee. It was like, yo, guys, we've been drinking this thing called coffee, but it, it actually hasn't been very good. So we should be drinking this other stuff. So I got deep into coffee and uh, during the pandemic, it provided an opportunity for me to to kick off my own brand. So how does one get deep into coffee, right? Because actually, you know, it's funny at BuzzFeed, we had, I had that head, right? That coffee head who brought his own scale, sprinkling it out. And, and I went and asked him if I could taste it and it was delicious. Is that, is that the best way? Is it just, is it a passed on thing to get deep into it? And, and do you need all that equipment? Do you need the scale? Do you need that slow dripper to really appreciate a cup of coffee? You do. I mean, okay. So, I mean, I think conversion comes through a number of avenues, this, this kind of coffee conversion experience, right? I mean, on the one hand, if you walk into, like if you're in downtown LA, you'll see these uh, blue bottle and you'd be like, this looks cooler than Starbucks. Maybe I should go in there. You go in there and you order your coffee and it's $7 for a cup, you know? And you're like, wait a minute, what the hell's going on here? If I'm paying $7 yeah. for a cup, something, something's happening here. And so I've, I've known people who got into specialty coffee just straight through the, what's going on here? Let me try this. Oh my God, this is something really different. And then you also have like folk like me who, uh, and like you, who someone will show up to the house or to the workplace with the, with the gear and like any craft, the more tools you have it more, you know, to a point, you know, the, the finer the technique. So, and the better the, the end product. So sure. Like there are $150 scales for, so that you can weigh your coffee, you know what I'm saying? Like, because they want that precision. They want the speed people who are doing this professionally or whatever. So. Just like I think with any discipline, you're going to have tools to for the craftsman to really tune it in. But that difference might be marginal and only perceptible to like those who are really finely tuned to it. But that's still some of the fun because it shows that there's depths to this. I love that. So let's talk a little bit about the brand because it comes off very intentional, right? Like I got this package that not only had the coffee, which is delicious. It also has stickers. It has a postcard. It has rolling papers. And it also has this message of trying to make the world less whack. Talk to me a little bit about how you thought about branding and how important that branding was to align with the coffee that you're putting out there. Sure. I mean, I knew in doing this because I have a great job doing cool work at my nine to five that I can develop Mestizo as a brand that I didn't need to enter the marketplace with the goal of selling as much coffee as, as fast as I can to as many people as I needed to, which might've been my impulse if I was dealing with another kind of product yeah. and I needed to pay my mortgage with it or whatever. Right. So I was like, okay, I, I'm going to be able to create a brand that probably more closely reflects me uh, as an owner and operator than other types of products might permit. Basically as a artist, my coffee is my album. Hmm. My oh. coffee is my mixtape. My, my, and the cool thing is you can drink it. You can put this in your mouth. You can actually get something material kind of into you, you know, in the process. So I was very intentional. So there were things that I knew I didn't want to do. One thing I wanted to do was say a couple of things with the brand messaging. One, Mexican Americans appreciate and produce high quality craftsmanship. You could see it in the pyramids. You could see it in our law practices. You could see it when we order top shelf mezcal and yeah. when we pay for the most expensive strain of, of weed. Like <laughs> we do this shit, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like we will pay for, you see it in our $380 sneakers. We will pay for it if it's good. Now, most Mexican American coffee drinkers aren't even up on the fact that there's this thing called specialty coffee that most of the coffee that they're drinking is bullshit, industrial grade trash. So I'm coming in kind of as an evangelist saying, hey, there's good news out there. We like good shit, mm -hmm. but we're drinking bad shit, but I got the good shit, you know, like essentially like as simple as that. You know, that presents its own challenges too when you're, I'm trying to convert people into a more expensive kind of category. Yeah. But um, I'm with it because again, I know we spend the money. That's such an important part, right? I think that, you know, especially 
we saw the census and we, we continue to see the rise in Latinos, Latinas, Hispanics, whatever we can get into that whole thing on what, what do we call ourselves? But, you know, the United States has always been multicultural, but what we're seeing more and more in the last couple of decades is the disposable income of people of color, of, of people of different races and ethnicities. And so a brand like yours is important. How does that play into it in, in terms of the rise of the disposable income, the rise of our ethnic group to kind of have more purchasing power in, in the United States now? Well, one thing I'm recognizing is the value of the data just off top. Like one thing I need to constantly do is to check my instinct and impulse against data. And so one way I'm doing that, in fact, there's a great uh, research firm headed by a Mexican-American called Think Now Research, who had some great research around Mexican-Americans and premium alcohol. And the data around that demonstrated that Latinos prefer high-end products to have higher end packaging. Oh, cool. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So I, that, that was like, that's really valuable data. I don't know who else has asked. Like not a lot of people are asking that question to our audience, you know what I'm saying? And the fact that they're asking that question and that I was able to find that piece of data is going to inform what I do moving forward because I'm in that category. So my impulse, most of the time, you know, that's, that's part, that's part of the equation, right? Of course, with anything, you kind of got to go with instinct and I want to do what I want to do and not what other people tell me to do or whatever. So you kind of, it's a, it's a soup, you know, in the end of the day, but, um, I will try to kind of look at behavior generally, and then more specifically, how are the people who are buying my coffee behaving, you know, and then kind of just getting more granular, like in terms of, so it's, it's going to be easy for me to get lost in trying to chase this huge Latino market. Yeah. Yeah. And trying to do all these things to say, hey, I'm over here when I have 300 people who've already said, I fuck with your brand. Yeah. Here's my money. I'm turning my attention to them to kind of build it kind of organically. It's super smart. And I think what we're seeing, especially with, would you call your brand a direct consumer brand? Absolutely. Is yes. this kind of recognition that you can go deeper, right? Like a, a brand can be deeper and have have more to it right. and still vibe and people will still want to buy it and still want to go and, and grow from that versus, you know, what we've learned in the advertising world is, you know, before quadrant or what is the biggest total potential demographic that you can have there. So I love that you're data informed, not data driven. So you have the brand, you have the insights. how did you get the product? Do you have your own roaster? Are you collaborating? How, how do you actually make the coffee? Most of specialty coffee is a white boys sport, you know? So, and I'm not even going to front. So I do I do like the white boy Pacific Northwest specialty coffee aesthetic. It is a vibe. Yeah. Like I could rock with it, you know what I'm saying? But that's it's not my vibe. It's not my native kind of vibe, but I could get I could get down. I, I like it. Uh so most of specialty coffee is is a white man's sport. I'm friends with the most prominent Mexican American roaster in the US. His name is Angel Medina and he's out of Portland, Oregon. And so I work with him to develop roast profiles to fit my audience. So the cool thing about that is, of course, that I'm doing business with another kind of Mexican American entrepreneur in the coffee space. And the work he's doing in Portland is kind of making a difference in, in how people view the Mexican American coffee drinker. Oh, so that's really dope. So it gets roasted out in Portland. Although I did do a collaboration locally with a roaster named Brian Gomez, Mexican American roaster out of Southern California. You know, I, I view it as collaborations, like who's doing the work that I want to be associated with and then partnering with them to put out an excellent product. It does feel like the early days of kind of craft brew, right? Like where there, it seems like there's some regionality now in the United States and, and there's different vibes, different tastes, different textures that are going on. Do you, do you see a, a similarity there? Absolutely. No, I'm actually taking a lot of cues from the craft brew scene. And there's a lot of interesting stuff happening around collaborations, artists and beer brands. And then even in California, it's like it's Latinos who are at the forefront of do doing some of these interesting collaborations. So I'm watching what's happening there. I recently put out two collaborations that were inspired by what was happening in the in the craft beer industry. Yeah, let's talk about those. The first collaboration was with a rapper, Alameno, who's in a group called the Visionaries, who's it's just a kind of legendary underground group in Los Angeles. Cool. Alameno has a passion for coffee. So we put out an album that's connected to the bag of coffee, scan the QR code, get the coffee. More than anything, it was a marketing experiment to see if streetwear culture, rather to see if kind of the, the tactics 
around streetwear and hype beast culture might be applied to coffee. Okay, cool. Which is to say, if we put out a limited, a limited amount drop. of these bags, yep, that's a collaboration, limited drop. The cost of the coffee, was if it was just coffee, would have been $23. Oh, wow. 25 maybe. But because it has the album on it and you get this bundle and you get to be part of this 123 people who got it, the cost is $40. And so it was an experiment to see whether people would actually pay pay more for this thing. And people have. So I was like, okay, interesting. Let me do this again. So I doubled down and released a second collaboration with a producer, a beat maker, um, this name Piece 586. And this collaboration is called Black Love. This bag of coffee, scan the code. Again, you get a, an album whose music is inspired by the theme of Black Love. Oh, amazing. And there's a whole there's a whole bundle that goes along with it too. So talk a little bit about the come up of QR codes, right? Like so I loved it, right? You you told me check out the bag. I I popped that QR code, got beats almost instantly. You know, we both have been in advertising for a while. Five, ten years ago, QR codes were corny. Nobody was using them. They weren't happening. But they're actually useful now in my life, especially I've been at restaurants where they're like, here's the menu or or pay with the QR code. Can you talk a little bit about your experimentation with QR codes and, and the value that it's brought to your brand? Sure. I mean, the cool thing about coffee is one other thing that attracted me to it as a product is the fact that we, it's one of the things that we touch on a daily basis. If we drink it is like the bag is like part of our, our ritual. Yeah. And that actually opened up, opens up an avenue for a lot of ways to maybe deepen our connection with our consumers. And so that was my thought around including a QR code on my bags. If you buy my standard roast, the QR code will take you to what I call extraction an online coffee shop which is only available if you have the copyright so you scan it and there's you get fed content there video and, and music content and then with the albums with the collaborations with the hip-hop artists those qr codes take you to a site where you're able to play music and i'm able to deepen the storytelling around the product so you know i've treated it the qr code as a kind of special wristband that gives you access to this cool content and you're right, some people still are slow to like adopt usage, even though it's yeah. sitting on their bag, which is why I sent you the message to say, <laughs> you know, don't forget to give it a try, you know, because some people are like, oh shit, I forgot, you know, whatever. There's yeah. like my, my gum has a QR code. I was I was tempted to scan it, but I was like, I don't need to fucking scan no gum QR code. So I can understand why people are like, I'm not gonna scan no coffee QR yeah. code. So You're like I get it, it's really gum. Good. I don't need instructions for gum. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you also outside of the coffee world, you you also have a blog, Big Brown Dad. Talk to me a little bit about the genesis of that, the work you're doing there, and, and what's it all about? Big Brown Dad. I started that blog maybe five or six years ago when I just wanted to do some writing in public, as it were. Like I want had some funny stuff I wanted to reflect on around parenthood, and I wanted to share it. And it's really as 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 modest and ambition is that. But what I've you know, to date, I probably published 100 articles, 150 articles, one driven by the impulse to just kind of represent brown fatherhood publicly. Like I'm a Mexican-American father living in Los Angeles. This is what it's like to raise a kid. My experience as a Mexican-American, as a third generation Mexican-American who doesn't uh, speak Spanish, but who lives in Los Angeles, which is predominantly Latino, is going to be different than maybe people's immediate perception of what it means to be a Hispanic dad in Los Angeles. Some Hispanic fathers don't even speak English. So I thought it was important for me to be out there and say, hey, this is my experience. It's representative of others. And then, hey, brands, like if you're thinking about brown fatherhood, consider this experience in the process. You know what I'm saying? Because we have different experiences. It's an important one. Uh, you know, I shared some similarities there, right? Um, Puerto Rican, don't speak Spanish. Father side, didn't really grow up with them. So it's a weird vibe when I come into these meetings, especially on the agency or, or the sales side, they, they want to kind of hit me with their, you know, we did some Latino Hispanic investigation and here's what we're hearing and talk Spanish language. I'm like, Oh, wait, wait, I don't speak Spanish. Why are you, why are you showing this to me? Can, can you talk about that difficulty of perception versus reality on, on what it means to be Latino? Yeah, for sure. Like I got my first, after I got back from Mexico, I got my first job in television writing for Telemundo's English language network. Uh -huh called Mundos. 
Okay. So Telemundo in 2003 launched an English language network, kind of like a, a ver their version of MTV. Okay. Was it geared towards a younger audience? Was the idea there that like, this is not your grandmother's Telemundo? Exactly. And then they took another bet, which was that the biggest audience at the time was by 100% American, 100% Mexican, or 100% Latino, 100% American. So it was like, and they want their programming to be Spanglish sized, like a mix of English and Spanish. Like that was the notion that that was the era we were in. And I think the data supported that notion at that time. And at that time, again, it was the notion that we are Spanish speakers. We adopt this American English language and we adopt American customs in the process of assimilating. Even at that point, I was third generation. I represented as maybe a smaller share of, of the demography of Latinos as a whole as English dominant. But in the last 20 years, I think, well, the data is showing that we have at least two thirds of Latinos in the US prefer their media in English. Yeah. One third are English only, one third are bilingual, but consume the majority of their media in English. And one third is that immigrant population that speaks Spanish and unfortunately gets most of the ad dollars and attention yeah. because the people in charge aren't don't understand what's happening on the ground all the time. I love the writer room stuff. Can we dig into that a little bit? How how did you bring yourself into the writer's room? How are you make uh, how did you make sure that there was different perspectives inside the writer room? Because it was reality television, and were, were you doing some uh, scripted as well? Or no scripted, all all unscripted. But as you know, unscripted okay. has scripted it's scripted ba baked into <laughs> it. So yeah, so I was doing so some of the cooler experience. I had a chance to produce. Well, oh, this is cool or not, but produce Bristol Palin's uh, Lifetime reality series, which sent me to Alaska up to this uh, Palin compound. Oh, funny. And spending time with Bristol and, and Willow and doing working in reality. Of course, again, it's like media is, is, is not a, a brown man's sport. The difference I can tell you though, and I worked at a white owned media company for about 10 years and at this black owned advertising agency for five years. And I can tell you the difference between being at a minority owned company and being at a white owned company. So often you'll hear about this kind of burden around kind of code switching and kind of having to perform. Yeah. Me, I felt because I was one of the, if not only on most occasions, brown people around, I had to do some sort of different justification, explain, like over explaining the reason why yet yeah, I belong here. You know what I'm saying? Like, and where I work now, all that shit, like, I don't have to worry about none of that, bro. I don't know why or how that's true, but yeah, cool. it's just so crazy. Like. <laughs> It's just so crazy, like the difference. Is that the ownership or is that in yourself that you don't have to worry about that? I think it probably, it's all probably, it's all in my, it's probably all in my head, even in that first right. case, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm just doing it too much or whatever. But no, I think of course, culture, company culture does come from the top down in a lot of ways, or at least leadership does impact company culture. But I think when you get people of culture working in a place where it's diverse, and the leadership itself is diverse. The ownership is diverse. I don't know, bro. It just feels like we don't have to explain a whole bunch of shit that we feel we'd have to explain otherwise. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I feel you on the, you know, sometimes there's that I have to speak for all Mexican Americans or all Puerto Rican Americans, right. like where when it's more diverse, you're speaking for yourself and you're, you're right. offering an opinion versus your now on the hook for 65 million other people and their tastes right. and what they're after. Um, well, you see, like me, I have less a problem with, if that's a problematic for sure. I have a less a problem there. Like, hey, you expect me to speak for everybody? That's silly for sure. But my problem was also like, well, you know, I have a right to speak, right? Because, you know, I went to college, right? You know, I read books, right? Like, you know, you know, I know who <laughs> yeah. these guys are, right? You know, you know, I study, right? You know, like, it's like, calm down, bro. Like, you don't need to do that all the time, except in yeah. environments where you feel like, fuck, I need to do this all the time. I don't know. It's, it's tricky. No, yeah, that, that's a big one, right? Is is always having to put up your credentials, right? Your bona fides have to go up every single time that you talk. Do you still feel that way? Or do you feel like, you know, that stuff's in the past and, and now I can I can just focus on putting pen to paper and making this, this work? Well, you know, I do want more out of life and I do anticipate having to demonstrate some credentials or whatever. Like as, as you do more, people are gonna be like, if I'm, if I'm going to trust you with more, show me that I should or whatever. So I, I get that. You know what I'm saying? So 
I do think that will continue, but maybe I just need to, I guess when I get, if I get wealthy or whatever, I like, I guess I really don't give a fuck <laughs> or whatever, but like until then I'll definitely, I think this is all part of the game. Like, Hey, trust me because I've done this. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. I'll do this yeah. bigger thing. And then trust me some more. Cause I've done this bigger thing. Yeah. And you know, the, there's the, the wealth part of it, but then there's also the generational part of it, right? You have kids, I have kids. How important is it to you to kind of show your, your kids, Hey, there's a path for us, right? The, this, we can make some generational wealth. We, we can go to college and do all these different things. Yeah. I'm surprised that my daughter, she's savage with the roasting, bro. Like be careful. <laughs> like just the other day, she said, she said, she looked at my hairline and she says, dad, when I see your hairline, I think of the McDonald's song. Dun, 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 dun. I'm loving it. I was like, oh shit, they're receding that badly, huh? That said, I'm also surprised that she's paying really close attention to what's happening with Miss Diesel Coffee. She's like, oh dad, I heard you talk about this person who bought so many bags. Oh, hey dad, how's that collaboration going? Or So I see that they are watching and that's important, you know? Yeah. And of course, like I'm, I am building Mestizo so that there is something, if they're so inclined, that they can take the reins on or be involved with. As they're getting older, I will integrate them into what I'm doing with Mestizo. So it is exciting to see that they are paying attention, that they feel ownership over it too, over the success, over the over the story of how this brand is going to grow. So it's cool. Like almost, it's hard even during the pandemic. It's probably more a family project yeah. than it would have been pre-pandemic because it's all happening right here, bro. You know what I'm saying? It's all happening in the house. I'm learning about growing and cultivating an audience. I'm learning. Listen, if I wanted, and I have family who's in real estate, and they're crushing it right now, bro. And I'm like, damn, I should be maybe putting this effort into selling a a loan or a or a house or like. There's definitely more money to be made putting in the effort that I'm putting into to what I'm doing here. But what I'm doing here fuels and allows me to express my passions, you know what I'm saying? Which is creativity, community, comedy, hip hop, top shelf experiences. And that's what matters, man. That, you know, that, that you're feeling this and that, that the entrepreneurial bug that you caught is providing positive vibes for you and your family, right? That That's important. Is this something that, you know, was passed down this entre- Is it something that you wanted to do as a little kid? Were you starting little companies as a kid or, or is this something that kind of came a little, a little bit later in life? Is there something about negotiating, transacting, connecting that was cultivated as a child for sure. Cause I did have the job of junior careers. Hi, my name is Carlos Aguilar. I'm a junior careers. We're a nonprofit organization designed to help at risk kids like me stay off the streets. Would you please buy this candy? door to door bro as a <laughs> yeah. 12 year old i was going door to door in strength okay how about this a, a fucking 23 year old rocker picked us up like 12 kids up in the back of a van with no seat belt threw us all in there took it to a strange neighborhood and we all lugged around these boxes selling four dollar candies where we'd keep 90 cents wow this was a legal racket apparently and probably still happens but wow. that's how i cut wow. my teeth on the door to door vibes Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I did a little door to door myself uh, in, in college. I was uh, in Lawton, Oklahoma, which is where Fort Sill military base is knocking door uh, door to door, uh, trying to sell educational books. And it was a trip. Uh, it, I, I think it's helped me throughout my life, but it's also scarred me for, <laughs> for sure. some of my life. Cause I was talking to military families who were like, what are you doing knocking on my door? <laughs> Man, this is 25, 30 years later. I still tell my wife, I'm like, I think I, I think I was, I smell a familiar tree. I think I was on this block as a 12 year old. Like <laughs> this neighborhood seems familiar. Like it's weird, bro. PTSD for sure. Talk about some of the quick thinking that you have to do as a door to door salesman or, you know, pitching something like this, where the response is always no, right? Mm. If they open the door, it's going to be, I don't want it. How do you work with that? Walk me through some of your rap there. Oh man. I love it. I actually recorded, I recorded one of my most recent, the audio of one of my most recent transactions. With a with a with a bagelry oh, cool. down the street because I want to see like I wanted to hear how it went and see what I could do better or whatever. But of course, like w- when I'm walking up, I'm looking for a source of connection. Yeah, yeah. Can I get? Can I gather something about this person? And then I'm often thinking about my first kind of line. Like then I'm getting deeper into it. Maybe I'm trying to ask a question. So first off the top, I see that you sell coffee here. Where do you get it from? Or 
Are you looking to sell more premium coffee? What I did recently. So what I've decided to do with coffee. So you might ex suspect like the existing coffee shops don't want my coffee in their shop. So getting my coffee in coffee shops is what people tell me. Hey, bro, can I get your coffee? Put it in a coffee shop. I was like, nobody wants my coffee in their shop. But there are probably coffee adjacent spaces that might consider carrying my coffee, like a bagel shop, like a donut shop, sure. like a panderia. So I was like, all right, let me find some spots locally or, or a barber shop, which is I do have my coffee at a barber shop in Alabama. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's smart. So it's like trying to find these, these alternative distribution channels. I went to a local liquor store. The dude looked like a homie. Cool. I said, very likely that he at least listened to me. I mentioned the fact the coffee is roasted locally. One of the names of the coffee is the name of is Route 66, which is a popular, you know, highway that is, is where we are. So I try to, again, just try to find the connection. Yep. I'm familiar. Yeah. Try to demonstrate the value. Hey, and you know, I'll bite the bullet on these early accounts. This is on consignment. Cool. Doesn't cost you anything. You get to keep whatever you, I say you get to keep and I keep the rest and easy breezy, bro. You don't have to buy it or anything. I'll just, I'll take the risk. We'll put it up here and we'll see if it sells. And um, yeah, I don't know. That's that's kind of my approach to trying to convert people face to face. It's a great approach. And you know, it, what's funny is, you know, as I've been talking to a lot of these people starting their business, a lot of the first sale is cold call. It sounds like it's the same for you. Yeah. Um, you know, friends and family are going to support and help out and buy a couple bags or, or do that. But it really does come down to the cold calling. And you know. Are you seeing that that's where a lot of the sales are coming initially? People talk about humility or being humble as a goal, and it is of mine, a virtue, but we forget that humiliation is connected to humility. And like, there's nothing more humiliating than asking someone to buy something from you. <laughs> like, I don't know if that's yeah. true for you or not. I mean, like, I guess if I had a fucking bar of gold on discount, I wouldn't be as humiliated. But like, yeah. I'm trying to convince people to come up out of their pocket and I'm asking them five or six times. And that's not a great feeling, but it's definitely part, I think, of the bitter pill that I need to swallow if I'm going to grow my business. And that is both approaching strangers on the cold call front, which is humiliating. Like my first encounter with you is me asking you to buy something from me. Like that ain't great. You know what I'm saying? It's also true from friends and family. Like I don't want to ask people multiple times to buy my coffee, but I know I need to do that if I'm going to grow my business. Yeah. So we've been talking about the sales and the product and, and the branding. What are some of the, the nitty gritty things of building a business that, you know, you were shocked that you had to do or, or that you were surprised were going to take up more of your day? Well, I was like, I, I considered for a moment, as much as I love the Mestizo name, I considered maybe changing my name to either Sticker Mule Coffee or uh, USPS Coffee. Because as much money as I pay these motherfuckers for everything I do, <laughs> it's like, let's let's go in together guys like what, what do we got to do to work together so like shipping of course it's, it's killing it's like it's part of the, the bitter poison i need to swallow with a dtc business too I, I can make more money every time i ship out a package and there are things i need to do to do that we bag one bag of coffee off me it's going to cost 25 dollars to get to your door right it's like nine dollars is 850 to nine dollars shipping bro so oh, wow yeah, yeah but if you buy two bags of coffee you only spend forty dollars and my shipping cost is still the same, 850. So I make more margins when you buy two bags than when you buy one. So I'm yeah. trying, and you save money when you buy two bags versus when you buy one. But most people I'm finding have fucking sub subscription fatigue. People don't want to like subscribe to another thing, you know what I'm saying? Even if it makes saves them money or whatever. So that's part of one of the challenges I'm trying to solve for is like, how do I encourage people to buy more coffee? Each time they buy coffee. Are you bundling the coffee together? Kind of like taste test bundles? Or? I do have a, subscri have a monthly subscription, which is a two bag subscription, but I haven't done like, let me think about this, but like do like a hit your fruit bomb and neon chocolate together for a thing for, for one. Yeah. Yeah. I, sh I should probably encourage for those people who are going to buy mechanically each time. I need to encourage them to buy two. Well, one thing I did was make shipping free for 35 and over, which is to compel you to buy a second bag. Okay. So cool. it's like, okay, so if I get yeah. a second bag on free shipping, I should do this. But yeah, so that's one kind of shipping is one thing, which is like, I started this as a DTC and I'm not really, I don't want a coffee. I don't want a coffee shop. I don't want to operate one or own one, but it's making sense to have my product in different stores at the same time. 
for sure. So I'm getting pulled in a couple of directions. I just have to figure out how to maintain profitability. Yeah. You know, and it, one difficult part is, you know, the allure is going to be the taste, right? Is how do you get them to take the little sip? And, you know, so it's a little bit easier for somebody to do a blue bottle or a stump town subscription because they're getting that at, at another store. Right. That's one of the big hurdles that you have right now, right? Is, is how do I get people to taste this so they know that, that it's high quality? Well, okay. That's, that's a very good point. Now look at it from the other way too, which is I've always marveled at my interest in Top Chef where I'm, I, me and my wife will argue about who's the best. Yeah. We've never tasted anybody's food. <laughs> You've never tasted Right, you know what I'm saying? So like True. 300 yeah. people said, your coffee tastes good, or I believe it tastes good without ever having tasted it. What are they reacting to then? If they're not reacting to the taste, what are they reacting to? And that, I'm trying to figure that out, right? So, and then I'm gonna double down on whatever it is that said, that convinced, because once they try it, like it's gonna, then we're good. Like if they like the coffee and the coffee's good, then we're there, right? So I wonder, so I don't know that I should try to get let as many people as possible taste it before buying or something like that. That is part of it for sure. I'd, I'd love to do that. I think for you, it's the branding. You know, I, I think, you know, going to your website, you, you, you create an immersive experience right off the bat. And especially now in this world where, you know, I think they call it the blanding where all these DTC brands look the same, right? Mm. They all have kind of that millennial pink or that light blue and the same type of font and you're coming out hard. <laughs> and rugged. So I think there's something to that too of people right. looking at it and going, okay, this this is not that soft millennial brand that I've seen somewhere else. This is coming a little bit a little bit harder, a little bit rougher. Sure. So I think that's connecting with people as well. You know, and it tell me if I'm wrong on this, it does feel like you thought a lot about that brand and you thought a lot about how all of this comes together, all these pieces that it's not just the coffee, but it's the the entire brand of Mestizo and what it means to you. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it comes out of, again, my experience as a, as a hip hop artist, my experience creating media. And I'll tell people that Mestizo is really a media lab fronting as a coffee brand. I like that. Yeah. So it's like, um, you know, I've probably produced 25 video interviews, some involving comedians about their morning routine, others involving authors and other creatives scholars discussing issues that seem interesting to me because this is my brand and this is what I want to talk about. Like kind of yeah. going that route. Uh, I produced two comedy roasts. Uh, we did a, oh, cool. we did a fuck 2020 comedy roast uh, to launch Mestizo. I had like nine comedians roast the year 2020. And then we did a fuck love comedy roast in February. So again, just creating, creating comedy. And then my newsletter, the animated videos, the music. Can't wait to get back into some real world shit soon. Yeah, it seems you keep yourself very busy it, are all, with all these creative outlets. What, what's the one that gives you the most energy, right? If you could spend all day in one area or, or do you need to be diversified like that? One thing that's interesting is that I've in these collaborations is that I've almost started to run a de facto record label. I, yeah. I didn't. It's like because I've had to my collaborations, for example, two different artists I've worked with so far and I'm talking to four others. Right. So it's like. I imagine this is what a record label is like, like get on the phone, talk to this artist. How are you, what's the promotional plan? What are the assets? What do you, what's on your calendar? Who are you working with? Who can we connect with on your part of the team? All right, great, bro. Click. Ding. Oh shit. A whole other person. Oh shit. A uh, whole other personality. Yeah. Whole other everything. Hey bro, what do you got going on? Da 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 da. All the while I'm over here. So that's kind of, that's kind of cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I didn't think I'd be that guy. But it's kind of interesting to, to be able to bring people together to do this thing. It's kind of it's kind of fun. So I, that's that's what I'm doing at, at the core is bringing people together to put cool shit out into the world. And we just hope it catches on so that I can continue doing it. You know what I'm saying? Continue paying for this shit. You know what I mean? All right, cool. What recommendations would you give to people who want to start a business, are thinking about it, but are still just grinding away at their day job and not doing it. And, and, you know, for me personally, I was that guy, right. That if you grabbed a beer with, I was like, I want to start my business, blah, blah, blah. And it, and it took until I was out of a job to, to do it. What would you recommend to somebody who's sitting there mm. hoping to start their business? I would recommend two things. One, go product over service because if the product, of course you can build a site and sell 24 seven. And then connect with a community 
whether that's a small business entrepreneurship community or it's a alumni group or it's a startup community. I recently connected with a cultural online cultural community called Casa, which has a bunch of entrepreneurs and creatives in it and that gather on Slack. And when I got started, they were kind of the folks in that group were foundational and sharing, buying, talking about and bigging it up. And these are all people I most whom I've never met in person, who I've only gotten to know during the pandemic. And if I had to do some quick and fast math, probably a good 25 to 30 percent of my sales have come through this group of people who I don't even know, bro. Oh, wow. Like that. You know what I'm saying? So and I think a lot of us are even today. I don't know if you're like this, Keith, but I just interacted with this dude who has a new salsa brand out of San Antonio. Oh, cool. And that seemed like a product to me. I was like, and this is kind of maybe my messaging that I want to integrate moving forward in some way, which is there are a bunch of products that I buy that I'd much rather buy from people that I know are from brands that reflect my cultural values in some ways. Absolutely. That's, that's fucking deodorant. That's Jared, that's hair gel. That's coffee. It's salsa. And so if this dude saw, hopefully it's hopefully it's good. Cause I'll keep buying his salsa, but I'm kind of as a consumer on the consumer side, I think more of us are looking, are looking to spend our money in ways that better reflect our values. Absolutely. So build that product, build the community and buy from the people you know and love. I love that. Yeah. So Carlos, thank you so much. This has been a super fun time talking to you. If people want your coffee, where do they get it? They go to mestizo.coffee. And um, if you're in the San Gabriel Valley, hey, nah. uh, yeah, you can get it online, Cause, but you're going to see it popping up in um, tire shops, wig shops. I'm going to try to get it in all these uh, obscure, <laughs> obscure locations. No, I love that, man. Yeah, I mean, so say it one more time. <laughs> where, where can they get the coffee? Mestizo.coffee. Yep, yep. Mestizo.coffee. And you can also find us on IG at Mestizo Coffee. Awesome. Carlos, thank you so much. Keith, thank you, man. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to The Change Up, produced by Elena Weedland, with original music by Rodney Hazard. If you liked what you heard, we'd appreciate your support by liking, sharing, leaving a comment, and subscribing wherever you listen. Thanks once again. Until next time.